Hello, and welcome to the Syncretism Society Virtual Academy. Um, thanks for joining me again. Today, I felt like it would be best to go over some alchemical practices that we can be doing um, alongside our esoteric practices that we are doing on a monthly basis. Um, now, I did want to mention that, you know, the processes of um, alchemy are always ongoing and everyone is at a different place. Um, in their consciousness of the alchemical transformation. <clears throat> it is best to start cyclically and seasonally. However, it's good to just be aware of all of them thoroughly so that when the time comes every year, we can be prepared to um, be in sync with the seasons, um, to syncretize ourselves and our life and our actions and our intentions with the higher purpose of the, the cyclical happenings that that go on um, eternally. So <clears throat> felt like to be able to have a good support for the, the overview of the transformations that are taking place, um, there should be various practices involved that can help you essentially awaken consciousness. So the first technique we went over is abiding in the essence. And this is used to create a center within yourself that is outside of the influence of the four elements. Um, so fire being, you know, anger, water being emotional melancholy, wind being airy thoughts, not being able to keep track of your thoughts. <clears throat> or just the mind in general, your water being the emotions, fire being your impulses. So by abiding in the essence, you extract, you identify with the part of yourself that's not um, involved. Um, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says he is the self in all beings. And um, that self is, is not necessarily involved within the um, happenings of the four elements. It's outside of it. So I'm going to verbally walk you through this. Um, if we can place our attention between the brow of our eyebrows in a way that's similar to being cross-eyed, however, it is not going cross-eyed. It is very comfortable. A slight glance to the horizon in front of you and that should be able to awaken a sensation right there between your eyebrows. It's very similar to a slight, it's almost like you're intending to go cross-eyed, but you're not. Now, you're going to combine this with the Mona Lisa smile, which is to slightly smile with the actual physical mouth so that the corners are slightly risen in the same way that Mona Lisa smiles in the picture. This is an ancient secret of meditation. And by doing this, you should notice the muscles <clears throat> in between the space of your ears and the back of your head should slightly tense, or you should feel a sensation in the same way you would if you attempted to move your ears with this smile. This smile opens up a central channel that allows the energy of the torus field to be able to come in and out of the body and freely move through the central channel. So we place our attention between the brow slightly, not going overly cross-eyed at all. Eyes slightly looking towards the horizon. Smile slightly with the mouth so the corners are slightly risen. Place tongue behind the front teeth. You may also perform a mudra by placing your thumb and ring finger of both hands together. Now, you're going to slowly squeeze and pull up on the perineum muscle, which is the, the muscle you use to stop yourself from urinating. 
and none of this should be uncomfortable. So now we've placed our attention between the brow, eyes halfway open. You want to have half light and half darkness. You want to have both sun and moon in balance. And what you'd want to do is do the smile now, slightly move the corners of your mouth upward. This would be like, you know, people wouldn't really be able to tell you're smiling, but it looks like a small, slight smile. And you'll feel the muscles in between your ears um, flex. If not, just, you know, be familiar with this essence, this beautiful, small smile that opens up the central channel of the heaven, the gate of heaven. It opens up this gate and allows the energy to flow. So we've combined the eyes, the smile, the tongue behind the front teeth, and the slight pull up on the perineum. And none of this should be uncomfortable or forced. The back should be straight. And you can either be in, you know, cross leg position or just simply sitting Western style, which would be like an armchair or any chair. <clears throat> Essentially, once this technique is mastered, you know, while you're meditating or doing, you know, you can do this with the other practices in combination, you can activate this state of being at any time. It doesn't matter if you're walking down the street, you can place your attention between the brow, eyes slightly toward the horizon, smile slightly, tongue but behind the front teeth, and a slight tense uh, tensification of the lower dentine muscles, which is the sacral muscles. <clears throat> this is how you activate an internal alchemical battery charge and abide in the essence because as Manly P. Hall said, and he got this from the Eastern traditions, of course, but there's a lot of power by abiding in the essence and being able to have your identity be placed in between your eyebrows here because it said this is where the cave of Brahma is. And this is where the optic thalamus is. This is where the uh, man's ability to control his lower nature resides. Um, we don't put enough tension here. See, the Eastern, you know, they put a bindu or a dot there, or they do the, uh, the Vishnavas. <clears throat> I can't pron pronounce this correctly, but <clears throat> they put a sacramental um, ritualistic marking on the forehead. And this draws attention, conscious and unconscious attention to that area. Now, we know where attention goes, energy flows. <clears throat> so we're activating and, and creating a target for that energy. Jesus has been referred to as saying, take no thought. We've learned a lot of this if we've listened to some of Bill Donahue's teachings, hidden meanings. You know, he explains quite a bit that Jesus tells us to take no thought and how this is a slight, in, you know, this is like a, a, a way of them hiding this beautiful meditative allegory within the story of the drama. And I like to connect this to a quote from the Upanishads. And, and I wanted to kind of syncretize these and show that the teachings of Jesus are similar, if not 100%, um, in alignment with the Upanishads and the teachings of, of meditation and sacrificing the labors or the sacrificing the fruit of our labors by, by moving and acting without attachment. So we have a quote from the Upanishads <clears throat> says, meditation here is not reflection or any other kind of discursive thinking. It is pure concentration, training the mind to dwell on an interior focus without wandering until it becomes absorbed in the object of its contemplation. But absorption does not mean unconsciousness. The outside world may be forgotten, but meditation is a state of these intense, in, it is a state of intense inner wakefulness. So when we take no thought and we no longer have thoughts as an object of our attention, and we focus where our being resides within and focus on the part of us that's not the body, we can become absorbed in this state 
and reach a level of samadhi, which means to be immersed in the self and no longer have identification with the body for a period of time. So how do we take no thought? Is that just as easy as, you know, just saying that? Well, it takes a, a long process of actually um, becoming aware and observing your thoughts, watching your thoughts. Um, when you have a thought, instead of just thinking it, you know, question, where does this thought come from? You know, first you're going to question your thoughts, observe your thoughts, but slowly you begin to now notice your thoughts, but from the outside and no longer identifying with the thoughts. And now the thoughts no longer affect you and you're able to question, well, who is the one thinking these thoughts? And as soon as you ask the question, who is the thinker? The thought dissipates. And now you're able to realize that you are in control of the thoughts, how you react to them, and if you entertain them with interest. Good and bad thoughts are going to come, and it's up to us whether or not to entertain them. And if we have a negative thought, or an, a desire, or an addictive, um, an addictive tendency coming about us, and we have the thoughts that nurture these come about, we can choose to whether or not to entertain them, or we can jump to the technique of abiding in the essence, canceling out the thoughts. And by doing this, we can separate from the mind. At first, you know, we think we're the body. Then we might just think that we're the mind. If you pay close attention on the path, you'll discover that you're not the body or the mind. And they're both vehicles for the supreme inner individualized being. So you can decide what to do with your mind and you can make a decision in any moment to not think. And when you refrain from thought for a given amount of time, you're creating a charge because the energy that's used to create those thoughts or to monitor those thoughts or that attention where that energy goes is no longer fixated on the thoughts, but on the supreme self within. This completely recharges the mind and makes it very sharp. Here's a quote from the Tao Te Ching that also syncretizes with this. He says, colors blind the eye. Sounds deafen the ear, flavors numb the taste, thoughts weaken the mind, desires wither the heart. The master observes the world, but trusts his inner vision. He allows things to come and go. His heart is as open as the sky. What a beautiful excerpt from the Tao Te Ching. Isn't it interesting that, you know, colors blind the eye because the true colors are transcendental. True sound, the sounds of this material realm deafen the ear because this, the spiritual sound of the spheres are the true sound. Flavors numb the taste because our inner ability to taste is where the true spiritual taste it, exists. And this material world, even though it's um, so attractive and, and beautiful, um, is actually a conditioned place that is almost a shadow or condensation of the spiritual unlimited realms. So when we take a break from these outpouring that we have in this physical realm, it starts to charge something within us, it charges our power to connect with what's invisible and eternal. It just so happens that when you shut your eyes and I tell you to see a marker in your, like a whiteboard marker, and instantly you see the whiteboard marker. Or I say, hear the sound of a, of a gong. Immediately, you begin to hear the sound of a gong. Now, it is arguable that you may have had to have firsthand experience of these things here in the physical realm to absorb these knowledge, to able to acquire them transcendentally. But I say it would be more to say that these things exist eternally and we're able to grasp them as our physical body is able to transmit and be a receiver for pre-existing transcendental things. Mm -hmm. 
So when we abide in the essence and we start no longer identifying with the body, we can observe the world. And because we're not coming from a place of desire, you can trust your inner vision because it won't lie to you. The mind will deceive you if your intentions aren't correct. So sometimes, you know, sometimes your inner vision is not actually your inner vision, but actually psychic aggregates that are coming from the lower chakras or the subconscious mind. And it's clouding our vision. So we may react host hostile or paranoid. Sometimes our inner vision is projecting our own behavior and is now interpreting situations as if it's against other people, but really it just seen things that irritate it about itself. So when you get to this state of consciousness where you can abide in the essence and, and be in the I am and not fall into the animal mind or any thought below the cerebrum, as George W. Carey says, to completely put an end to any thought below the cerebrum. We're going to create a lot of energy abundance that will be able to sharpen our thoughts, create a better ability for flavor by going without junk food and aspartame and MSG and all these chemicals. We're actually saving our taste for true things to taste like fruit and all the beautiful things that God created for man to eat. But if we're too busy eating processed foods, then we numb our taste. And if we just eat for our senses, then we will never be able to taste the real truth, you know. And if we just let our thoughts constantly go wherever they want and, and, and to dwell upon the past and the future and, and think about um, negative spiteful things, then our mind is going to be weakened from that energy. And if we constantly just engulf and, and, and combine our, our passionate desires and let it touch lust, then the combination is wreck. As Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, lust leads to anger, anger leads to delusion. We can never be deluded or confused if we always abide in the essence, observe our thoughts, come to a place where we can trust our inner vision, and as Lao Tzu says, he allows things to come and go. His heart is as open as the sky. We could all practice to let things come and go. To know that there are higher principles and intelligences working behind the scenes that make things take place. There's a causal realm. and We're in the world of effects. We can't control everything. Krishna says to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, sitting and concentrating the mind on a single object, controlling the thoughts and the activities of the senses, let the yogi practice meditation for self-purification. Hold the waist, spine, chest, neck, and head erect, motionless and steady. Fix the eyes and the mind steadily between the eyebrows and do not look around. With serene and fearless mind, practicing celibacy, having the mind under control and thinking of me, let the yogi sit and have me as the supreme goal. Now a little esoteric spill here, practicing celibacy equals white tantra, retaining the sexual energy, whether you have a partner or single. Um, and then, then there's breathing exercises that can help you um, if you're single, but if you have a partner, you can combine this with this breathing exercises and the alchemy and have great results. So having the mind under control and thinking of me, this is the same type of me that Jesus is referring to in the Bible when he says me, or, you know, be still and know that I am. Me is talking about the supernal higher uh, Petr Atman that exists within the Jiva, which is our, that sits beside the Jiva. See, Arjuna represents the human soul, spiritual soul, who is the higher part of the soul that is looking for wisdom and truth. And Krishna is the Petra Atman inside.
that is the connection to the supreme source and the intelligence of the personal um, cause that is the supernal well of wisdom, all wisdom, all knowing, all truth. Whereas Arjuna, you know, he is the highest potential of the human soul. However, he is still has the ability to be confused. He still has the ability to need Krishna, this the archetypal Christos or Christ being to explain to him. In the same way, we get our premonitions and our dawnings and our um, our hunches from this supreme soul or super soul. And sometimes we have to like sit and like, you know, oh, what's going to happen or what do I do? And then we get the answers and flashes of intuition. So here's the you know, the play between Arjuna and Krishna. They're 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 one but separate. So, and this is referring to the meditation I was explaining in the beginning about abiding in the essence. If we just find time through a couple of times a day or throughout the week to sit and abide in the essence, which means to focus on God as the supreme goal, or God, which would mean to realize the truth of your being, the cause to sit and meditate between the brows. Do not look around, as it says in the second paragraph. If we abide in this and, and take it very seriously, we, we will activate our inner guidance system and we can have a small play out of this Arjuna and Krishna story that to take place on a level in our lives um, that we can be conscious of, you know, to see that, you know, Krishna represents a scientific fact. Arjuna represents a scientific fact. This is esoteric science. These beings represent faucets and aspects of yourself and reality. So it's very important to know that, you know, these correspond to different parts of you. In the Bible, we see references to uh, meditation, such as, and it's very hidden because in the Western tradition, you know, they like to put things in a very dramatic way, in a very nonchalant way. Uh, so here you have it. He says, and your tongue shall stick to the roof of your palate, and you shall be mute, and you shall not reprover of them because they are rebellious house. Now, notice this could be talking about astrology, because there's a lot of words in the Bible that have to do with astrology, like crucifixion, crossification, ascension, descension. The rebellious house. Could it be talking about the rebellious you know, planet in a bad aspect um, on one level? But it's also talking about meditation and the and to reprove the rebellious house, which could be maybe a, a, a zodiac aspect in your chart that's causing your lower mind or animal mind to come about. And by putting your tongue at the roof of the palate, it become, makes the mind mute. The mental chatterbox begins to completely stop. And now you have been able to take control over the rebellious house, which is the nonsense that goes on within our lower mind. Uh, we have the ability to shut it up, transmute it, and go back. See, humanity has lost these technologies. Um, it's been on purpose. And also because of Kali Yuga, age of forgetfulness. So when the tongue is connected to the roof of the mouth, the chattering stops, mind becomes mute, and we are able to reach the air level of consciousness of non-thought. So we go earth level of consciousness where we are um, you know left and right thinking black and white logical um, very fearful um, very egoic to water which is truth air to be no thought and then once we have the non-thought consciousness we await for the time of the baptism of fire where the fiery serpent of kundalini rises to the top of the brain and activates that fire. But you need to have oil in the lamp to light the lamp so that when you reach this air level of consciousness and the seed rises, you'll be able to experience your summer or spring as the buds of the cerebrum bloom and blossom and the dead brain cells are renewed. Problem is, is we, we don't allow this process to happen and we've done so much against it that we don't get the opportunity to experience an inner summer anymore. We don't get an opportunity to um, hear the small voice within because we're in constant battle with our thoughts, polarity, thinking, thinking about tomorrow, thinking about the past. 
Well, it's okay to get melancholy. You can invoke melancholy. You know, you can invoke melancholy from Saturn and, and sit and ponder the past and think about good memories. That's totally fine. But we're talking about when you want to banish things like that. For example, when you're feeling very melancholic and sad and, and thinking about the past, you know, this is a, you know, an aspect of Saturn or, or a watery nature that would be something that you would want to take control of and say, you know what, I'm going to be in control of these elements. So if we utilize this, you know, essence where the consciousness resides between the brow and we utilize the tongue between behind the roof of the mouth, then we can put an end to, you know, this lack of control that we think we have, we don't have. Now, allegorically, the sun is the, the carpenter, is the master carpenter. And look at this play on words. Why is the sun or Jesus or the solar beings assigned to the role of carpenter well one thing the sun is in houses the sun is always building houses and we are born with a particular astrological house makeup and the sun in its sense of carpentry is creating bodies physical temples or houses that souls dwell in and if it wasn't for the sun we wouldn't even have wood to have our little miniature carpenters that are like you know like people actually get a job as a carpenter they're like miniature manifestos of the supreme carpenter that's in the sky. As above, so below. Here on the earth, things appear very uniquely. So we have like jobs with carpenters and we have these references. And we know that there's a lot of esoteric symbology behind the carpentry work. Um, and this all has to do with the sun and, and our spiritual duty. And um, Knowing that the sun is a carpenter that builds houses, we are miniature carpenters and we build our physical house, our temple. We also build spiritual houses through meditation and saving the seed. So meditating and doing the will of the higher mind lets you build your inner temple, your inner house. You become the carpenter. The best times for meditation would be 6 a.m. Aries or 6 p.m. Libra, because when the sun is in 6 a.m. Aries, it's very um, in the head, and the head has a lot to do with meditation, and when you're meditating, the energy is very quick to rise to the brain at 6 a.m., because where attention goes, energy flows, and at this point, this is where the sun's attention is, and 6 p.m. Libra, opposite of Aries, when the scales are balanced and the sun is going down, the energy start to lower so that this isn't another time where you'll be able to meditate. Because if you meditate too early or too late, you might have too much energy built up or be too tired to meditate. So it's good to meditate first thing in the morning and at night. And utilize these times to meditate. That, hey, at 6 a.m., I just woke up from a dream. So we can wake up, record our dreams in a dream journal, before you forget them even if you don't remember the dream but you just remember like going down a slide or something like that just write that and pay attention and observe the in-between states right as you wake up in the morning you're barely coming out of a dream state so you can catch yourself in this transit because these are the best moments to experience the self the soul and if you're cognizant between these times of going to sleep and waking up, you'll have a better chance of astral projection, a better chance of putting beautiful affirmations into your subconscious mind to heal yourself. Now pay attention before going to sleep and recognize that, you know, as soon as you go to sleep, you're going to be entering a different dimension. These dimensions are some things that people live their whole lives without observing or taking note of. But as in, you know, if you're practicing the esoteric sciences, you definitely do not want to not pay attention to 30% of your life, which is done dreaming and in the dreamless state. We can take advantage of these states of consciousness to complete our soul purpose. There's masters who practice their craft while they're sleeping and transfer that information to the waking state 
when the practice transfers over, whether it be skating or playing guitar or singing. You can learn the mysteries from your directly from your being. But because our sleep has been so interrupted and our consciousness has been so asleep, we're not able to take advantage of these as we naturally should be. Because we've been indoctrinated by school and atheist thinking that dreams are just in the brain. And that there's no real such thing as dreaming. And that there is no detachment from the body. If you study the mysteries and all the great masters, they've all explained that the body separates from the soul. The soul separates from the body at the time of sleep and travels the inferior and superior dimensions. Because when we do, when we dream, there are times where we're in the lower sephiroth, when we're in, in pain and fear and desire, or we might find ourselves in a very high sephiroth or dimension where we're literally playing, maybe perhaps tag with God or Krishna, or possibly um, learning knowledge from a sage. Or you know, in the Upanishads, it says there's beautiful things that can happen in the dream world. You know, the soul loves to go to the waking state, go about its work, and then return. There's this huge paragraph in the Upanishads where all it's explaining is the soul coming to the waking state, doing its duties, returning to the causal plane, going to the dream realm, experiencing um, beautiful things, and then coming back. So this is like a natural process of our soul. If we look at our soul as like a creature or something kind of separate, I know it sounds weird to look at it as separate, but what I mean is like, can you just take a look and, and look how interesting a human being is? That we go through these three states of consciousness, that we are not just the body, we, we are the witness. The fourth state that experiences, or the experiencer, the first waking state, dream state, and dreamless state. And everyone has their own particular three, and everyone has their own particular witness. And uh, everyone's experiences. Um, spiritually mechanic you know spiritually technologically the same so just a very varies of how much consciousness and awareness there is and how much light so here's the beautiful synchrota will and this represents our journey this is our journey of creating the philosopher's stone and being able to become self-cognizant, individualized beings, and progress to the higher planes of consciousness. And we go through Aries to Pisces, and Pisces back to Aries. It's the prodigal son we'll get into the allegory of the prodigal son in future lectures. But I just want you to take a look and notice that the great work is within you. We are Jacob, the hill catcher. And we are continually taking part in the alchemical journey of transformation that we did not invent. We did not say, oh, this seems like a cool idea. This is perennial wisdom. There was no inventor. It's created by light. The knowledge is created by light. And the knowledge manifests in us, and it's up to us to be the action. Or I like to say that we are made to play the music that God created. So we, we're, we play the music that God creates. That already created music. We are able to play it. So notice the difference between the permanent and the transcendental as opposed to the temporary and mundane. And when we meditate and abide in the essence and follow Lao Tzu and Krishna and Jesus and their teachings, we begin to extract the consciousness out of the ego like a bottle. And we liberate ourselves from the body and the mind and experience our true unconditioned state. 
This will activate our inner compass, our inner guidance system, which will communicate with us through synchronicities and lead us to exactly where we need to go to fulfill our dharma and our purpose here. That's why the compass has so much symbology. The problem is not everyone has an activated inner compass. And right now there's a war on it. So that we trade in our inner compass and our inner guidance system for a false ego. And now we've enthroned the wrong person. We've enthroned the antichrist within the top of our brains when we let the ego animal nature control the activities of our inner consciousness. So we have to take back our power. Here's another quote from the Upanishads. As the sun, revealer of all objects to the seer, is not harmed by the sinful eye, nor by the impurities of the object it gazes on, so the one sweat self dwelling in all is not touched by the evils of the world. This is a very powerful quote. You take a look at it. Hey, that sun up in the sky is the revealer of all objects. Without it, you'd not be able to see anything, nor would there be any way for physical life or even individuality. It is not harmed by the sinful eye, meaning you can look at the sun all you want and think bad, bad of it or be a sinful, dark look towards the truth. And the sun is not harmed in any way. That light continues to shine. So the truth is the one self that dwells in all that substantiates our being and allows us to have the substratum of existence is not touched by the evils of the world. That's why Krishna says, Sages don't lament over the living or the dead, and we should not worry. This does not mean not to take action. Krishna says to fight in the war of life, to, to, to do our duties. However, don't think that, you know, the soul of us or, you know, or God is actually being harmed. The creator is, and, and the soul are outside of the, top, of the elements. And this is a very grandiose secret that can help us Eliminate suffering forever. We merge our individual self with the inner sun and let it illuminate us fully. That's the inner sun. So if we take advantage of the inner sun of the Leo, the lion heart, and merge our personality with the inner being, it will illuminate us and our actions and our 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 behaviors in the world will have light in them. We will see the world of light rather than of darkness. Now to utilize the physical sun, we, I want to thank Santos Bonacci for teaching me this, this technique to utilize the power of the sun. We can stand barefoot and hold our palms up to the sun, just like the Egyptian king Akhenaten. And combining this with the previous activities that we explained in abiding in the essence, we can absorb the prana. The Lamb of God or the lamp connects with the palms. Palms, if you look at the word palm, P-A-L-M-S, you'll see the word lamp. The lamp and lamb, the lamp that the hermit card is holding all the way up to the top of his head is in the Lamb of God, Aries. This is where our lamp is. Our oil is reserved in Scorpio, transmuted up into the lamp, feeds the lamp, and the light connects. The palms are connected to this through a circulatory center of chakra veins, or nadis. And you take your hands up, and you put them towards the sun, and you inhale through your palms. I know it sounds weird to inhale through your palms, but your consciousness can imagine this. And by doing it, it will pull in the energy, pull in the light from the sun to the palms of the hand and direct the energy to the lamp in the brain to create a wonderful circuit of energy that will give you enough willpower and Christic atoms to be able to have enough willpower to subdue the lower mind. Thank you, Santos Bonacci, for teaching and relaying this beautiful information to me. Um, this technique has definitely helped me. You can feel the Taurus field just whirling and, and increasing its power and velocity by uh, um, adhering to these techniques. 
from knowing that the palms of the sun absorb the sun, sorry, the palms of the hands absorb the sun, go straight to the lamp of the brain, activates clairvoyance, higher intuition, more astral projection, and also recommended that your feet are bare during this process. It's not recommended, it's almost a must because without the feet being grounded, there is no way for the electricity to fully come into the body. Well, I hope that you know these practices are going to help you along the journey of the alchemical transformation and the great work that we're all trying to accomplish. Um, tune in next time uh, to the Synchrotism Society Virtual Academy, and uh, we're going to continue this journey together, and um, we're going to definitely take control of our lives again and start living empowered and completely crush our bad habits and start being light and, and, and of use to our fellow men and women. God bless.